Hey, what's up fiber folks? Welcome back or welcome to High Fiber Knits. My name is Emily and today we're doing a podcast episode. In my head, it feels like it's been a lot longer since I've podcasted than it probably actually has been. Was that a proper sentence? I don't even know. But today is December 5th when I'm filming and honestly November for me was both the longest and the shortest November I have ever experienced. And I think that's mostly just because it was very out of the norm for me. Um, we did lose one of my nonnas at the beginning of the month and so once you know, all of the services had completed for, for her passing. Uh, I jumped straight into three days of parent-teacher interviews. It was my first time doing parent-teacher interviews, but they were all virtual, so I wasn't going into school. It was just a very out of the routine kind of week for me. We weren't doing classes or anything like that. So that was odd. <laughs> and then we went back to class and because we had been out for a little bit, we sort of had to wrap up any assessments we had to do and get grading done because now report cards are about to be due. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of myself for how I've been handling my first handful of months as a teacher. I really am. Um, but there are just some things we did not do talk about in teachers college so now it's just kind of like I, I get the pedagogy I try to do good pedagogy I'm learning about good pedagogy still as I'm going but I never learned how to do report cards so I I'm just you know you keep on keeping on it's been both very challenging and very rewarding and I'm so blessed to have amazing family and an amazing partner and amazing colleagues who have been so, so supportive of me um, over just like honestly the entire fall, but especially the last month. Um, but I'm also really grateful to have had knitting to just turn to, to have my time to kind of just shut off everything else and do something that is for me and for my mental health and for my pure enjoyment and really not much else. So despite all the craziness of the past month, um, I have had some good knitting time. I do have a finished object to share with you, as well as some progress on a couple whips that you've seen before, as well as a lot of progress on a brand new whip that I have sort of talked about kind of it'll be clearer when we get there and i also have a couple small acquisitions so we're gonna hop into the knitting now the first thing i want to share with you today is my finished object and it is this little snow snowy roughly winter tree so when I last podcasted, I had pretty much just cast this on and I told this whole long story about how I'd seen an ad for the National Ballet's Nutcracker and in the ad they were talking about the snow scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in the Nutcracker and I performed it when I was in high school and I went to a performing arts high school. Um, and so I was just talking about a lot of the really positive memories and nostalgia I sort of had around the Nutcracker and that sort of inspired me to lean into a little bit of decorative knitting. So I cast on this little mini tree. Now what I did to construct this tree was just cast on at the base and knit decreases along the way up um, as well as as I was working my way up to the peak of the cone um, knitting some setup rows so that once I was completed with or once I was finished with the cone I could go back in and add all of these ruffles and for this I just used all scrap yarns 
Um, I had a leftover ball of Rowan Alpaca Classic, as well as some silvery mohair from Hobby that they'd sent me a little while back. And why the tree looks like a little extra metallic-y is the Trailhead Yarns lace weight tencel that I had left over. So I held together a lot of different yarns for this. Um, the base is knit at a much denser gauge than the ruffles. The ruffles are just two strands of lace weight yarn. Um, so that was fun for, you know, getting a lot of yarn out of stash, getting a little decorative piece ready for my space for the holidays. I do also have like a mini, I'm just looking at it now, that's why I'm looking over there, um, a mini Christmas tree that I decorate with silver ornaments for my room. And so this looks cute with that. So this was a fun little project. Couple of things about this project, however. First thing is I did write a pattern for it, but I'm really not sure if I'm going to release it either as a free pattern or a paid for pattern because the way I went about constructing the ruffles is not identical to, but remarkably similar to the way the ruffle from Laura Penrose's souffles are constructed. And so um, I don't know how I feel about how close the technique is or if, you know, it's in a different enough application that it doesn't matter. But I feel like if it's giving me unease at the moment, then it's probably not the right thing to do. Laura, if you're watching, maybe we'll chat. I'm really not sure. Um, there's a lot of different ways to construct ruffles, but um, I genuinely don't think I would have come up with a way to do this had I not previously knit the summer souffle. So that that I think is enough for me to think that maybe no, I, I don't know. <laughs> the other thing is, if I were to publish a pattern, I would want it to be something that is enjoyable and easy to knit. And full disclosure, the gauge that I knit this at was really, really tight. It was quite difficult to knit, and because I was like so dialed in on, on this and nothing else for like a day and a half, and because the tension was so tight, um, the way I hold my needles puts pressure on my ring finger, and I ended up having numbness in my left ring finger for several days. And I don't think it was nerve entrapment because um, like the nerve that innervates that finger comes like around down the funny bone that's sort of the nerve that like you feel when you hit your funny bone and it comes down through your arm and it enters your hand and it goes to your ring finger and your pinky finger but I had no problems in my pinky finger I'm usually pretty good about like doing nerve flossing exercises things like that um, but it was just my ring finger that was numb for like a week and I couldn't knit that week because I was really scared to like cause any more severe or any more permanent damage. My finger's fine now. But all of that is to say that if that was something I experienced with my own pattern, it's not something I would want to recommend other people do, if that makes sense. I mean, you could probably knit the cone at a less dense of a gauge and like actually stuff something into the cone to help it hold its shape but as is I mean it is what it is I don't know if I have much else to say about this other than I do think it's it's cute I think it's Christmas tree-ness is not too on the nose which is something I like I don't like Christmas decorations that are like the word that's coming to my mind is chuggy, but that's not really what I mean. Um, I like wintry decorations, not specifically Christmassy decorations, if that makes sense. I like more of a thematic decoration. So this is my little 
nutcracker snow scene inspired winter tree that is not likely to become a true pattern. I mean, if you're interested in doing something like this, it's probably not too hard to figure out. Sorry for being really cryptic about it, but again, I wouldn't want to sort of share techniques that aren't my own brainchild. So, my little snow scene, Christmas, winter tree. In terms of other whips, I am still working on my partner Adam's mittens. I've sort of come to realize that I really don't like doing shaping in small circumferences because I very much tend to procrastinate when I reach those points in projects. With most of the mittens I've knit before, doing the thumb has been a sticking point for me. Um, with socks, I could like leave a sock at the end of the foot ready for the toe for a couple weeks just because it's it's simple shaping. It's not that it's challenging. Just for some reason, I don't enjoy doing shaping in the round for small circumferences. Even shaping, maybe it's just shaping that I like, I'll do it because it's necessary but I much prefer just knitting stockinette or knitting ribbing straight up in the round. So, so here's the finished one. Um, I use 3.75 millimeter needles, knitting for olive, merino, and soft silk mohair in the color brown bear. I did a modification where I knit a ribbed cuff. It's supposed to just be straight up stockinette um, for, for Adam. But what I wanted to talk about was the, the top of the mitten. When I was looking for mitten patterns for Adam, he had been quite clear about the fact that he wanted a tip that was quite well rounded, um, not shaped. You know, when you shape a toe and you're just doing K2, K2 together and SSKs, um, often you get a bit of a wedged sort of shape but he wanted something really rounded, which I think this mitten has. This is the arched gusset mitten from Pearl Soho, which is a free pattern that they offer in many sizes. And the tip of the mitten does have a nice roundness to it. However, knitting this on DPNs, I found to be really confusing. And I don't know if that was because I'm just not good at distributing stitches in a logical way when I'm working on DPNs, or if it really is just like a strange way to go about doing shaping for something like this. But I did find that to be a little bit of a nuisance. And to be honest, if I were knitting myself, a pair of mittens that were closed at the top, I would probably just do like a wedge the same way I would shape the toe of a pair of socks. Um, but but Adam wants the rounded mitten, so he's gonna get the rounded mitten. Uh, but that is a comment I wanted to make about that pattern. It's, it's not like out of my range of capabilities by any means, just not as intuitive or straightforward as, well, as a wedge toe. That's all there really is to it. My next whip is a sweater that I've been working on for quite a while, but I'm pleased to say that it's finally joined in the round. However, for that reason, it's probably going to be quite a challenge to share with you, but we'll do it anyway. Here is my Hour Pullover by Sari Nordland. So the Hour Pullover said it several times before, I'll say it again. It is a bottom-up raglan, so I knit the body and then I knit the sleeves individually. And you can see that the sleeves have been joined to the body and I am working the raglan decreases towards the shoulders. And that hole in the underarm is supposed to be there. It, it's supposed to just be sewn up um, at the end of the project. And so, I'm really happy that this is joined in the round, but I don't think 
that I fully appreciated how many stitches there were going to be on the needles around the underarms. Like these rows are absolutely huge. And if or when I was bringing this with me on the TTC, in a one hour commute, I would maybe make it through one and a half rounds, maybe two rounds. I, I don't know. I just, it's so many stitches. And I don't think I fully appreciated how much knitting this yoke was actually going to be. That being said, when you see the next whip, I think it'll be clear that had I not been working on that next whip and had I just done that equivalent amount of knitting on this sweater, it would be done at this point in time. But where I'm at right now in the pattern with this sweater is following a chart uh, that's providing instructions on where to do the raglan shaping on each round because in some rounds you're shaping at both the sleeve and the body and then in other rounds you are just shaping around the sleeve so I'm following that I'm maybe a third of the way through the rows of that chart but of course most of the rounds having decreases are becoming smaller and smaller and smaller which means I'm probably like stitch wise closer to like halfway through. So once I reach the end of that chart, there will be some working flat and then I will go in and pick up stitches, the collar, knit the collar. It is a folded collar in twisted rib. There are other twisted rib details on this sweater, which I actually both love the look of and the process of knitting. So my incentive really to finish this should just be getting to the ribbed collar. Um, and then, and then it'll be done. Is it going to be done before the new year? I don't know. I would love for it to be done before the new year, but I just don't know. We'll see. The yarn that I'm working this up in is more knitting for olive. It is the merino in the colorway marzipan and the soft silk mohair in the colorway oat. And I think it's going to make for a nice, very neutral sweater. However, I don't know if it's like the most flattering color for me ultimately. I don't think it completely washes me out. Um, but I do think it runs a little cooler than the colors that really make me glow would. Um, so it, it is like a true neutral and it'll probably get a lot of wear for that reason. Um, but it definitely doesn't, I don't know, like light me up in the same way that like my purple Louvre sweater does. So I'm liking the color combo. I'm loving the yarn combo. But this is really, at this point, very much a product knit for me. My same but different video, if you haven't seen it, um, is a comparison of a handful of popular drop shoulder sweater knitting patterns. And the whole purpose behind that video was for me to really break down what my thought process is when I am selecting a pattern amongst several that may be very similar but do have specific or distinct features about them. And I talked about things like fit considerations, modification considerations, um, yarn substitution considerations, um, overall wearability, lots of different things like that. And most of the sweaters I talked about in that video were from quite well-known designers. I had a couple in there from My Favorite Things Knitwear, um, as well as, you know, Petite Knit, Kajri, Ozetta, um, etc. And by the time I'd finished that video, I felt like I hadn't completely landed on something that I felt super excited about which, you know, that's okay. It wasn't a problem to me. I thought I'd just 
sit on it for a little longer, think about it a little while longer, maybe until I was done my hour pullover. And then at that point, I would make a decision and cast on something. But then I saw that Cage Ree had posted a test knit for her or a test knit call for her Harlow sweater, which is a drop shoulder sweater. And it is ultimately a combination of all of the features I liked best about all of the other sweaters I talked about in my same but different video, which was like absolutely incredible. So I applied to test knit. I already had yarn in stash, um, or I had recently acquired yarn um, with the intention of making a drop shoulder sweater. So I had the yarn ready to go. And so I'm gonna share with you what I've got. First things first, this is the yarn. It is the BC Garn Luck Lamond in the colorway Earth. And it's probably not coming up too great on camera right now because I have lamps pointed toward me. Uh, but this is 100% organic wool. It is GOT certified, which is really cool. And in one 50 gram skein of this yarn, you get about 150 meters. So I think that's around a DK weight. Um, and it is a very fluffy yarn. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is woolen spun. It's a two ply and it is very, very lofty, really fluffy. I don't know if I can find a yarn end, um, but it does the thing that unspun yarn does where you can sort of pull it apart with minimal force from a distance, but the closer together you grip the fiber, um, it feels very strong because despite it being loosely spun, if the length of each individual fiber is quite long, if it has a long staple length, then once knit up, the fabric itself should have a lot of structural integrity to it. So I picked up this yarn with the intention of not holding it with a strand of mohair. The Harlow sweater is knit in another BC Garn yarn quality. I think it's the Semolina Pura, and then that's held with a strand of mohair. Um, but I wanted, as I said, in same but different, like a super staple everyday wear, like truly just chuck it on type of sweater, which you know, my louvre sweater is kind of like that, but it has the high neck. And so I feel that that's even still a little too done up for just like a super casual kind of sweater. So big hopes for this. And you can see one of the things that really drew me to this yarn is the tweed. This colorway earth has dark gray, kind of light gray, but then these like ochre, mustardy, tweedy flecks. And as I had said earlier with my hour pullover, like I do think I just look better, like color theory wise. I think warmer colors look a bit better on me, but I do love a good gray. And again, like this isn't working wonders for me, um, but I think it's still going to give me a beautiful product. And I think that the yellow Tweety Flex will add just like a little bit to it to warm it up and make it a little more visually interesting so that it doesn't end up being both gray looking on me and flat, if that makes sense. So that's the yarn. That's the story behind the whip. Here's the whip. So at this point, I have knit, I think, three and a half skeins worth of yarn on this. And I am done the yoke, the collar, and nearly ready for ribbing on the body. So here's where we're at. And I'll give it a try on in a moment. But I just want to point out the features of this Harlow sweater that really draw on the things that appealed to me in the patterns I talked about in Same But Different. So first thing is, 
the two by two rib. I think it was the town sweater by Ozetta that has this really beautiful but a little dramatic two by two rib. And I like the chunkiness um, and the coziness that the two by two rib offers. Um, but I felt that in the town sweater by Ozetta, there was just a little too much rib for it to be a practical wear for me. So I think in the folded collar, the application of the two by two rib works really well. I also talked about how I really liked this kind of neck shaping detail that appears in sweater number 23 by My Favorite Things Knitwear. I think that that detail here with the shaping gives a very intentional and cleanly finished look to the neckline. And in that video, I talked about how the neckline really can be one of the make or break features of a pattern. So I think that this neckline is very clean, very beautiful. Absolutely love that. If I flip it around to the back, we see that this Harlow sweater has the same really beautiful back feature along the shoulder that the Dartmoor sweater also by Kadri has. And I really like how this offers, again, some like structural support to the shoulder. I also really like three needle bind offs on shoulders. I really just like a clean crisp line that cuts across the shoulder. So I absolutely love this detail. I think it's going to sort of when it drapes over the shoulders going to add to like the nice relaxed sloping look of the shoulder. So very much enjoyed that construction. You can see there is some like rippling along this detail, but I imagine that once the sleeves are added, the weight and just blocking in general is going to open all of that up really, really beautifully. Before I try it on, you can see that there's a little bit of rowing out here where I've worked flat, but then around the body, it definitely smooths out a lot more. So my hope is that because this yarn is so fluffy, um, and when I did knit my gauge swatch, it did bloom really wonderfully. I'm hoping that any rowing out is going to be sort of smoothed over, concealed a little bit. The tweed also helps with that, but the tweed can also sort of make it look a little extra lumpy and bumpy. So I do like how the tweed in this fabric does come out quite minimal. I know there's a lot of knitters who will actually like pick the tweed out of their yarns to sort of tweed manage, if that makes sense. But I've been really loving how this is working out color story wise. So here is my progress so far on my body. I am knitting a size medium. My measurements will be in the description. And you can see it's got a lot of positive ease on my body circumference wise. When I test knit the home camisole, also for Kadri, that's a DK weight pattern. And I used one strand of Holescarn Super Soft on a smaller needle size. And I felt like I still ended up with a lot of positive ease in that garment as well, which may just be a matter of, you know, I know for sure my sizing in petite knit or sorry Nordland patterns. Maybe I just need to size down in Kadri patterns, but this does have a lot more positive ease than I thought it might. Um, I think this already has more positive ease pre-blocking than my Louvre sweater by Petit Knit does post-blocking. So I'll be careful not to stretch it out when I do block this, or I'll try to block it a little more for length than width, but I like a big oversized sweater. It's not a problem to me, but if you are looking for something that has a more moderate amount of positive ease, you may want to size down. 
You can see the arms rolling up quite a bit, but you can see it's going to be a pretty significant drop shoulder, which is good. That's what I'm looking for. And once I get to the end of the body, I'm going to go maybe another, like I'll go right into my hip bones. So maybe another few inches before I start the ribbing. This is also going to have a ribbed split hem, which was a detail that I really liked about a couple of the other sweaters, again, in that same but different video. So this is where we're at. I am quite a bit ahead of most of the other testers because folks in the US and in Europe were able to get some yarn sponsored, but that took a little while to facilitate, whereas I had my yarn and I could start pretty much as soon as the pattern was sent to us. So I am, I think, quite a bit ahead of most other testers, which is okay because I wanna get Adam's mittens done, but also I'd like to get this done before the winter holidays because my absolute dream for this sweater would be to go to the Scarborough Bluffs in the south of Scarborough, which is like a borough of Toronto. I'd love to go to the Scarborough Bluffs to take my finished object photos in this. I think it would just be so on point. I think it just, it just makes sense. I have a vision for it. I've been wanting to do finished object photos at the Bluffs for a really long time. And I think this is just the perfect project for it. So this is okay to go on ice for a couple of days. I do have that time and that wiggle room, but I'm also like knitting on this like crazy because I'm just, I'm loving it and I'm wanting it so badly. So I've been enjoying this so much. A comment I did want to make about the collar because this was something I addressed in my same but different video. Um, I don't know if the instructions are going to change, but picking up stitches around the neck at the rate suggested in the pattern gave me more stitches than the pattern said I should end up with. But I really liked the stitch pickup job that I did, and I would rather have a neckline that is doing something like this and add elastic to it, having a really clean pickup line, then skipping stitches during my pickup or having like bunching and holes in some areas around this neckline and having a snugger fitting collar. Like I said, I feel like the collar can make or break the sweater and I think adding in a little bit of elastic would be a really easy fix. So this is what the inside of the collar looks like. It is just sort of knitted down for a stretchy bind off, which I like. It was really, really fiddly to do, but it's also just a lot more work to do a full sewn bind off and then sew it down. So I'm gonna keep the collar as is, add some elastic once I'm able to get a hold of some and just weave it through the folded neckline. Which actually, I have a question for folks who have done that before. When you weave in elastic, do you sort of do it so that it is like somewhat visible along the inside? Or do you try to conceal it completely in the fold of the neckline? Because my concern is if I try to conceal it completely within the tube, then the elastic is not going to stay like high up at the top of the neck and sort of cinch it to my neck and it's gonna kind of like fall to the bottom and then not do what it's supposed to do. So if anybody has any good videos for how to add an elastic, it's probably like really straightforward, but I don't know if you have any resources or tips on, on how, how to do it if you've done it before, please do let me know. So this is my Harlow sweater test knit for Kajri and Maybe next time you see this, it'll be very near done or completely done. My last whip I'll show to you quickly because there isn't much to it at the moment, but I have cast on another 
Oslo hat mohair edition by petite knit so I'm like a couple inches into the brim at this point really nothing too extreme or exciting to report on but I do want to share with you the yarn combo I've shown you a swatch of this pairing before but this is using some leftovers that I have in stash, which is really exciting for me. I have two balls of Knit Picks palette in the color Iris Heather that I used for my Louvre sweater by Petite Knit. And I also have about 50 grams of this mohair, silk mohair, which is dust from the Knitting Loft in the colorway Squashed Plums. And I used this for my Cumulus Blouse, also by Petite Knit, both of which, both of these sweaters I knit this year, um, but I purchased the yarns independently of one another. It's been a big year of purple for me. I knit these two sweaters, I knit my Cami number no. 7 in like a plummy linen yarn, I've knit purple socks, and so I think it's just time to knit a purple hat. And I think that the Iris Heather being heathered with pinks and peaches and the squashed plums also being a variegated yarn is just giving me a very beautiful, a very beautiful fabric where the yarns are really just enhancing one another. I am very hopeful for this hat because I have a couple of two by two ribbed hats that I made last year and I love those but I find that both of them kind of have like a little bit of a cone that forms at the crown when I wear them and I don't know if that's because they're not long enough or if they're not wide enough or if that's just the nature of the shaping of two by two ribbed hats. Um, but that's a, you know, fit feature that I'm not super in love with about those. And I knit a different Oslo hat by Petite Knit earlier in the fall, in September, October-ish. And that I knit in a junior large using one ball of merino and soft silk mohair from Knitting for Olive. And that hat fits, but it's just a bit too snug. Like when I take it off, there's sometimes lines on my forehead because there's just a little too much negative ease in that hat. But I love the color. I still wear it. I still think it's very cozy. But with this one, what I'm hoping for is a little bit more length, a little bit more of an easygoing, relaxed fit that isn't going to slide off my ears. Um, is going to have, you know, good form, functionality, and look to it. So I've got my fingers crossed for this, what will probably be final cold weather head accessory of 2022. But we'll see. Actually, I don't know about that statement. So that's all the whips. I do want to show you quickly a couple of acquisitions. Um, the other night, Adam was like, hey, let's go to the bookstore and just browse for a little, which I was so excited about. So we went to the bookstore and we were in the bookstore for maybe five minutes when an employee came up to us and was like, hey guys, just so you know, we're closing in 10 minutes. And we were like, oh, oh no. <laughs> but we both ended up leaving with a book. I'm really excited about the one I picked up and Adam's really excited about the one he picked up. But we were in this sort of like strip mall kind of plaza where there's also a Michaels. So I was like, hey, could we go to Michaels and look at some craft stuff? And Adam said, yes, of course. So we went in and we browsed for about 45 minutes. We ended up picking up some stuff to do some DIY like painted holiday ornaments. Um, we really like doing a craft sometime around the holidays. Um, one year Adam and I attempted Bob Ross style landscape paintings with 
acrylic yarn, so that was a bit of a show, but still a, a fun afternoon. And then another year, um, I think it was winter 2020 when, when COVID was like, nobody was going doing anything. Um, I ordered some ceramic mugs from a like paint your own ceramic studio and we got the glazes and we painted them at his house and then drove them to the studio and they fired them in the kiln for us um, and we got to keep our mugs, which is actually something I'd love to do again. But anyway, this year the plan is to paint some ornaments. I don't really do vlogs, but I'll see if I can get some footage when we do that if you're interested. But the knitting relevant acquisition is some sock yarn. I don't know what it's like at like Joann's or, or Hobby Lobby or any of those other like big box craft stores in the US, um, but I think we really only have Michael's here in Canada. And other than like a lot of acrylic yarn and acrylic yarn blends, um, the only natural fibers Michael's really carries is cotton yarns. And for the most part, those are like home maker kind of cotton yarns, like Burnett Handicrafter and things like that. So, so not necessarily like the type of yarns I would select for my typical garment knitting. However, Michaels does have a small selection of wool yarns and sock yarns. So I picked up some Patton's Croy sock yarns. The one on the top is called Copper Colors, and it is a variegated yarn. It's four ply, and I think the sort of effect that this yarn is supposed to give is very similar to what you get from um, like a spin cycle yarn or a hand spun yarn because of the way the different colors have been plied or marled together. I've seen this yarn there before. I've seen a friend of mine here on YouTube use it before, although I can't remember whom, who, whom, I don't know. So I was happy to pick this up, but they only had one ball of it. And so I was standing there and I was thinking, and I thought of the Curio Socks by Andrea Mowry. Now I'm probably not gonna knit the Curio Socks, but what I remembered about that sock pattern is that it takes a similar yarn to this, I think it uses spin cycle yarn and it takes a solid colored yarn and it stripes them. So you have alternating stripes of a solid yarn and a color changing yarn. And I remember when I saw the Curio socks, I thought that was such an interesting idea. So I may just do something really similar to that with these. Um, I should be able to get a pair of socks out of the two balls because 150 gram ball is 152 meters. And this is a very toothy and I think quite thick sock yarn. It's very similar to um, like Drops Fable or Drops Fabel if you've used that before. It is also 75% uh, wool, 25% nylon mix. Um, or it also feels kind of similar to like Rosa Pomar Retrosaria Mondim, which is 100% wool, but it just has that like really toothy, grippy, kind of rustic-y sock yarn feel to it. So I picked these up. Realistically, not gonna use them super soon, but I do have the feeling that once I finish my Harlow sweater test knit, and my hour pullover by Sari Nordland that I'm going to want a bit of a break from sweaters. Last winter around this time, I just kind of started cranking out socks. Um, I had just started sock knitting, but I feel like there's a good chance that something similar is gonna happen again this year. So folks, that is all for today's podcast episode. I feel like I ended up talking a lot more than I thought I might, uh, but that's okay because I feel like I had some fun, different, interesting things, thoughts to share today. So thanks for hanging out. 
I hope you enjoyed the episode. And until I get to see you again, I am wishing you all health and happy knitting. Bye, everyone.